Hello, my name is Joe Cardinale. During World War II, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt created the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, the first centralized U.S. intelligence operations. Over 60 years passed, and in 2008, top secret records were released by the National Archives, identifying over 24,000 OSS agents' names withheld from the public by the CIA. All the agents were told never to mention that they were with the OSS. The OSS files presented details about former agents, including Supreme Court Justice Arthur Goldberg, Major League Catcher Mo Berg, actor Sterling Hayden, Jeff Julia Childs, and my uncle, John Cardinale. Here he is now, able to tell his fascinating story as an OSS agent during World War II. I was born in Pittsburgh, California in 1921, August 4th, 1921, and uh, moved to Monterey in five, six years later. At that time, we were a family of 11. Uh, my younger sister was born in Monterey, Josephine. I remember when my, my mom and my sister Sue were looking for a house for us to live in. House were scarce for a family that's large. So we found a house at the uh, Monterey Colton building there on, on Pier Street, right the end, next to the uh, Colton Hall. And uh, he asked my sister, how many are in the family? I believe my sister told her, well, five plus a mother and father. Okay, that's fine. As soon as we, <laughs> we rent the house, moved in, this whole gang went in there. <laughs> we're, about, we're about seven or eight. But anyway, we all moved in. Nothing was said, everything went fine. Then I got married. In fact, I eloped. I eloped, and the war broke. The war broke out. It's uh, December seventh when Pearl Harbor was bombed, and I got married December twelfth. And uh, my father-in-law didn't speak to me for six months because I eloped his daughter. And we had gone to Reno, and uh, came back. He still wouldn't speak to me. I moved to. Uh, my mother's house on Monroe Street, uh, she had moved out because the government had moved him out on being an Italian alien. That was in 40, in 42, early part of 42, yeah. And she went to Robles del Rio, inside of Carmel Valley, I don't know, about 20, 30 miles inland. And uh, I was drafted. I was drafted and, uh, and uh, my wife was pregnant at the time, oh, four or five months, no, longer than that. Maybe a few months pregnant, and uh, that put me in uh, uh, my training in uh, Procedure Monterey. So I took my training there, and uh, uh, they, uh, they weeded us out, and, and we took all kinds of tests for artillery and infantry and uh, cooking department uh, and radio. And I excel in radio. I was pretty good in Morse code, as, as green as I was. So they, uh, from there, they sent me to UC Davis in Davis, California. And Davis had a, a signal corps school there, uh, which uh, the Army had uh, leased a part of the, of, the, of the college. And from then, I was there about maybe 13 weeks, nothing but signal corps work, climbing poles and, and splicing wires. and. Morse code radio, which I spent more of my more, most of my time in in uh, Morse code. I have to admit, I was really good in that, and they're they're really they're really happy about that. So they sent me to um, Camp Butner in North Carolina, and that was the infantry. But they had mostly on on the signal corps side. We went on maneuvers while I was in North Carolina, and I was made a uh, uh, umpire, and we had a lieutenant there. He was in charge and a, and and a driver on the wagon, and out of the back seat with the radio and all that, and then have slap, and we have what's called a slap key when you're driving, you, the bounce, your car bouncing around, so. Well, Monroe, we had the green band, they had the red, the red uh, uh, army and, and the blue army, and the green band was the uh, umpires. So I we went to this blue camp, uh, evening time, 5.30 or so, theater supper. We had canteens, you know, we went sitting down in chairs like the officers and all that with dishes. As I'm coming out, 
of this big tent, uh, enormous tent. Uh, right outside the tent, there's a big sign. I imagine the sign must be, oh, uh, five by five posted alongside the, the opening of the tent, of the officer's tent. Then. And it says, wanted men uh, for hazardous duty, uh, OSS, we prefer foreign speaking language, and uh, new operated to radio, new operated radio, that means Morse code. And that was it, sign and all that. So anyway, I thought about it, you know. At that time in North Carolina, it was kind of snowing cold. I wanted to get out of there anyway. So I went back in the, in the uh, tent, the officer there, OSS officer, so I, I applied, filled the application, and took off maneuvering. And by the time uh, we got back to the field, and a couple, three hours later, I got a call uh, through the radio, it was voice radio, and it said, Cardinal, come back, you're headed for uh, Washington, D.C. I went to the bus station, presented this, this ticket, this uh, note that, that uh, Major assigned, and they had my tickets ready. From then, I went to OSS in Washington, D.C. When I entered Washington, D.C., the driver picked me up at, uh, at the bus station. They knew I was when I was coming. So from there, uh, the driver told me, sit in this room, it was like a desk, by myself. So I sat there in this room, and, uh, and uh, the major who was gonna interview me was in the next room. He had someone else interview. So I was there, I was sort of a nosy fellow, and I kept looking, oh, curtain, picture, you know, this and that, you know. and yeah, just to waste time, or kill time, this and that, you know. I was there about 10, 15 minutes. Then the major called me, the cardinal, he said, come in the office, I'm ready for you. So I told him to sit down, I said, okay, while you're sitting there, uh, what do you notice in that room? That was a test, I didn't know that, see? See how sharp my mind was. Well, I'll tell you, major, I noticed uh, uh, that lamp, tall side lamp, uh, and the, they had uh, blinds, and one blind was broken, and uh, there was, a, there was a, uh, a paper clip behind the stand Stand up light, standing light there. A paper clip on the floor. He had a picture of his, uh, of his wife, I imagine it would be his wife, on a desk. And there was Roosevelt behind me where I was sitting, you know, the picture of the president. And a couple other items, you know. He looked at me, he said, they are pretty sharp. I didn't even notice the paper clip, he said. <laughs> That's fine, that'll do it anyway. Then went to another room and he took my uniform. I, I always, you know, and gave me fatigues. Because two guys, two men couldn't go together. They don't want you to identify that guy. It could be a major, a colonel, a civilian, a PFC. You had to go 15 minutes at a time, you know. One guy there, another 15, another guy come in. And they all reported at this uh, big uh, two and a half ton truck. And, uh, and uh, we're all taken to this camp. I think it was Camp David, the, where the president had their, their retreat. And we're all equal. We're all equal there, and nobody could pull rank on you. If anybody pull rank on a PFC like a colonel PFC, they throw them out OSS. There's so no rank pulling, no sir, no nothing, no salute. Reason for that was um, we had uh, we had turns on on running a team of fellows, like you were eight or nine in a group, blowing up a bridge or blowing railroad tracks. But you had a lead. After you all through for the day, the other person come and lead and do other things, you know, that even the major, the colonel had, and you, they had to follow your orders. Even if you are a PFC and, and or the colonel had to take your orders. If they did not, then throw them right now. There's always so was strict about that, you know. And uh, from then on, I still taking up radio, code, and like I said, I was pretty, I, I learned more at the time there. And uh, I was going about 18, 20 words a minute. That's pretty fast. You can send, with your radio keep faster than you can receive. By sending, you can keep going down to that. And you receive, you gotta, you know, concentrate fast and be writing down your letters. And I was taking about 18 words a minute. 18 words a minute consists of five characters, like A, B, C, D, and E. That's five, that's a word. And F, G, so that's another word. So I was taking 18 of the five letter groups. And that's pretty fast. And each group went by the another group coming behind you in, in, in your radio. And uh, by the time you finish your, your, we say the fourth letter, the fifth is coming in, you go back, 
the fifth would come in and so on for it until you had the whole, uh, the whole uh, uh, message. So from there, I was shipped to uh, Maidenhead, England. Maidenhead, it's right outside of London. And they had a big mansion, all says took over. And uh, there was the uh, Allied agents there, and we took a group to teach them how to operate radio and decipher code and all that. I had a group of nine. And we got seven there that had code names also. The first two up there were man and wife. Now their their code name was Jack and Jill. Because man and wife. And uh, the other two guys, I think uh, the one on the right hand side and one below them, I think they were the uh, the Mac team. And the girl in the middle, the most popular, she was Kaja. From there, we were sitting in a ship to uh, uh, invade uh, Normandy. We were the first, the first landing went, and we're still sitting there, rocking up. I went the second landing. The first landing took a beating. And I think that, that landing, the Normandy landing, was, uh, was run by OSS agents. In the, in the enemy side, they told when and all that jazz, you know. They had, they had big hand in that. But they boast, any, any big operation like that, uh, OSS was in the middle of it. Now, any small operation like me taking that overseas, I mean, across the Rhine River, undercover dark, those uh, operators performed there right at that moment. Pentagon didn't know anything was going on there, but that's small stuff, you know, but important, but small, nothing big like a normal landing and things like that, you know. And the uh, Pentagon didn't know half of what was going on, to tell you the truth. But uh, if, they, if they needed information of the other side and all that, they say, well, send us a couple of agents, and that was it. First mission uh, was in Holland, the Rhine River, this uh, underground resistance fighter, I think his name was uh, the Dutchman. He had about approximately 150 fighters under him, resistance fighters, and he was in Holland at the time, see? And we were in, in, in our side across the Rhine River. Now he had radioed uh, to, the, to OSS there that he needed approximately 200 uh, automatic weapons. He didn't want rifles, Push automatic weapons. We call them uh, grease guns. It, 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 like a machine gun? Yeah, it, it's cheap made, but dangerous. The, the handle would fold in, and they had big clips of that. You clip in there, you fast release and all that, clip, put another in, and, and the handle would just come out under your, under your armpit. And uh, we call them grease guns. What they call them guns? Stern guns, I think. Stem with stern guns. Automatic. Made, England made them. But we call them uh, grease guns. Look like a grease gun, you know. They're cheap model, nothing fancy, but you know, they're good. And he wanted, he wanted 200 grease, well, grease guns, plus a clip in each gun. Already there, a load and all that, plus ammunition boxes to, uh, to, uh, to use in these grease guns. And he wanted blankets. Now this guy had rated it in, see. He wanted blankets, he wanted food rations, like a, a K rations or C rations. Well, K rations were dry stuff, looking like Cracker Jack box, but much bigger and thicker, and had, had a wrapping of um, wax uh, material. Where if it soaked in water, it wouldn't harm the, uh, the food in there. And they had C rations, which liquid that stew in there, and beans and all that. They wanted airdrop. They had pinpointed a, spa, a, a spot there in, uh, in Holland to make that airdrop. Now, this the colonel gave us this information. He thought, he said, well, you know, maybe, maybe this is false information. Maybe enemy wanted this, enemy wanted that, you know. So anyway, that two weeks go by. That time, we had decided what they wanted, headquarters wanted a couple agents to go, I think it was two guys up in front, the right hand side, to go inland, around, around the Rhine River there, across the border of, uh, of uh, Holland and, and Germany. And they wanted to go beyond Berlin. This uh, resistance leader, we had arranged that we're coming over. Okay, and uh, he was on one side of the Rhine, 
and more on the American side. It was dark night, so right around one o'clock or so in the morning, I rode across the Rhine River under cover of darkness, and, and uh, the uh, resistance guy was on his side with a flashlight, he could turn it on and off, I could see the, the light the quite a ways, you know. But he had a, he had a uh, cover it so it wouldn't spread out, just straight beam. Anyway, uh, it took me it took me quite a while, but it looked like forever. I much of probably took me 45 minutes to an hour and get to get across. The tide coming in, in coming in, and, and uh, outgoing tide. And uh, anyway, I got across. I unloaded the men, the two operators, myself, and the equipment we had. And uh, this leader had a guy with him, his right hand man, I believe, helped us with the boat. But the the rubber boat, one person could move it, but then. He moved it and uh, and brought it on shore there, in, inland. And then we, we, we kind of covered up the tracks so in case the patrol went by, wouldn't see a dragon of the boat, see? So he broke up the uh, the uh, markings of the boat. Anyway, went to the uh, first windmill. We put the boat there. They hung up one end, the other one, one end toward the sea, the one on the, on the ground. And the, the windmill, it was full of hay or straw. So we got the straw and threw it on the boat as if it's been sitting there and not being used. And, and the two oars, we slid it underneath the hay against, against the wall, against the back wall. And uh, anyway, we left everything there and we moved on to the next uh, windmill. And uh, he opened it up and showed how the hay all over the place. Those days, I guess they kept hay in there for cows for the winter or something. And that's to feed their cows. So he went to the fourth one, and this fourth one, he said, well, this is it. This is what we call safe home. Safe home. Why do you call it safe home? Well, you see the, uh, see the blade on the windmill? There's three blades. The blade was broken. Every windmill you went to, you saw a broken uh, fan or blade. That's safe home. That's where you have water. You have rations of some kind, whatever they had. But it has supplies. Anyway. Now, to get in there, the safe home, he said, here's where we're going to go. We're going to stay here tonight and, uh, we, and to rest because pretty soon daylight. So we went in there and we moved some of the hay from the floor there. And right at the bottom of the wall, the little trap door, sliding door, you slid it. Not the door you open, just a slider right against the flooring. You opened it up and uh, you had to crawl on your hands and knees to get inside there a room in there, a room that nobody knows but the, but the underground. And in that room, they had blankets, and the walls were covered with blankets. So because uh, the windmill, yeah, when, when, when they joined their boards together, you can see cracks in them. And this was all covered with blankets, solid black in there as far as darkness. And then you can turn the light on or flashlight or all that. And anyway, we all got in there and slammed the door. But before we, the guy slid, slid the door shut, he had a string tied up to the uh, hay that was standing. You know? He pulled it. Before he, before he got in there, he kind of roughed up the, the straw. He pulled it, this, hay, this, uh, this pile of hay up against the sliding door so they wouldn't see it. First thing he says, where's my supplies? So I couldn't answer him that. The only thing I said, well, I was study. I said, well, they're, they're working on it, and they're working on it, and, uh, and uh, she'll probably still be dropping it to you. I had to find out if that message is authentic, see? It could have been an enemy that sent that message, but it was authentic, and uh, I read it back, said, it was okay, start dropping. This fellow need equipment bad, and uh, I don't know how soon they got it, but they, they dropped it at the, at the spot where they called for and uh, from then, from there, well, it was daylight, so we couldn't go out because uh, Holland, where we were mostly flattened, and they can see a mile away, spot your mile. So we, we slept during the day, and at night, uh, we got up, and, uh, and the leader there, he knew where he was going because he had his troops uh, set different spots on, on the, along the road we were taking, anyway, the path, the road. And uh, he's, he'd uh, find uh, a bunch of his men, and the house thing joined. Yeah, we blew this up, we blew that up, and we stopped that, we blocked that tank, and oh, that's good, you know. Now I'm taking it all in my head. So I went to the next uh, uh, safe house. 
Now, before you get to the safe house, you tap on the wall, outside, exterior now. You don't go, you're not going inside, exterior. One wall, you tap, couple tap. All right, don't hear anything. Go to the back, tap. No response, go to the other side, you tap. No response, go in front, you tap. No response, everything. Nobody's in there. So you'd go in there and then settle again overnight, you know. And, uh, and uh, if you go in there without tapping, there may be a, a, a allied soldier or, or underground guy inside because if you don't tap, as soon as you open that door, that guy will start firing at you. See, that was a signal that it's a friendly troop coming in. So anyway, so you have to tap, otherwise whoever's in there will, will fire at you. And uh, I kept with the, uh, with the resistance, but they're blowing up bridges and blowing up tracks and blowing up armored cars and all that. I stayed with them, I think about 15 days, if I'm mistaken. And then uh, uh, I figured how to get back. Anyway, we went back to the windmill where we had the boat and yeah, put the boat in the water, the little rubber boat, and I ordered across. We were stationed at uh, Mearson Holland. We had uh, we had taken over a OSS had taken over a school, and we stayed there. And uh, our sleeping quarters was upstairs, and we had sleeping bags all the time, so we slept upstairs on the floor naturally. And uh, we had a little Bunsen burner downstairs. It was a, a little sink then. We used to warm up food with a helmet and all that. And one time, uh, the boy said, asked me, Cardi says, let's make some spaghetti sauce. I said, where the heck am I gonna get sauce, you know? He said, oh, we'll find some. Oh, come on, get some and all that. Anyway, the guy brought ketchup. Bottles of ketchup, I don't know where he got them at. And, uh, and no garlic, they brought a bunch of onions. And uh, a guy had spaghetti, by God. He got it from one of the ca field kitchens. And me and a buddy of mine, he was a sergeant also, both sergeants, we uh, made spaghetti salt. I threw all kinds of water in their ketchup. I put a little sugar in there. <laughs> we had packages of sugar. <laughs> and uh, me saw him, oh, John, he said, that's the best sauce we ever had. <laughs> so we had spaghetti salt. <laughs> I did, I just threw everything together. That was, that was a riot. Uh, then the war went on. and. And from there, after these boys uh, were in enemy territory, brought some back, some sent some good information. Then later on, about oh, a couple months later, went up, American troops coming up closer to Berlin. Then there's a bridge called Ramag, and uh, the Americans were on one side, and the other side of the bridge was Germans. Now, the Germans wanted to blow the bridge up, I I believe, yeah. So the Americans would cross it. See, you want to build a bridge, but 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 the crazy man, uh, German, they had about fifty thousand troops on our side. If they had to come back, they could go across here. They're they're trapped there. They're all dead. They would be trapped, you know. So anyway, they didn't care. They didn't. They want the Americans to go across. Anyway, they they begin to, I guess, um, set up with dynamite, the piers and whatnot. And that's when they needed information to see how strong the Germans were on the other bridge, on the other side of the bridge. That's the time I brought uh, Kaja over. She got a room in this boarding house, I believe. And then she got acquainted with the major, German major. So she got acquainted with the major and all that. Other information was coming in. It was coming in left and right. I, I, I couldn't believe the message that this guy was revealing to her. And then that's when the time when the Americans on our side, took over Rymagen Bridge. And, uh, well, she sent messages saying that uh, uh, there was a couple of companies uh, of German soldiers, uh, I think about three tanks there, and uh, automatic weapons and all that. And that's when the Americans figured, well, it's time to, you know, take off and knock the, it wasn't loaded with, with tanks, well, they only two or three tanks. And uh, anyway, they, I guess they stormed it on, right? I didn't see it, but I guess they stormed it because they went across. And uh, about a week later, we get a message that Kaja, Kaja got killed. Well, how the heck did he get killed? Well, she was riding in a Jeep with, some, with a driver, not in the main road. Main road is usually cleared with mines, just troops didn't go by, and, and tanks and, and vehicles. I mean, she went the side road. Was it cleared with mines yet? And she blew, hit her mind because the jeep hit her mind. 
probably blew her sky high. And that was the end of Kaja. When, when you were over there, I know you have some, some items here. That Could you tell us about your well, you know, a knife and a gun and a few know, things that, and dagger? And... That dagger sitting there, that's a, I would say it, it's a very important the, dagger. Well, yeah. This is made by a, 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 a captain by the name of uh, Fairburn. He had taught us in Washington, D.C. That's before I went overseas. I was on training then mm -hmm. at the time. He'd get one at a time to try to take this knife away from him. You know, hand fight and take the knife away. It was my turn. So he had the knife. It was this knife, in fact, he had. Mm -hmm. I tried to take the knife away, and he kind of slashed me in, in, in my hand. Uh, uh, Band-aid wound, OK? Mm -hmm. After I finished my trade with him, he knew we were all going overseas, you know, after all, we all had trained. And he called me, Cardinal, and he said, come here, I'm going to give you this knife. He said, I'm going to give you this knife, this knife that, that wounded you. I said, well, fine, I'll take it, you know, and I took it throughout the war. It had, it had a, a little strap, a one-inch strap. I used to strap this in my pants leg through the belt, under the pants leg. And uh, none of my boys, I should say, no, my boy, uh, our group, the 20, had the knife. I was the only one with that knife. I think he only brought a few from England to demonstrate how to uh, take a knife away from an attacker. He also taught us, in case you're, you're uh, walking to town, take a newspaper with you. Take a newspaper, that's a deadly weapon. So we ask him, well, what do you mean? How, how would a newspaper be a deadly weapon? So he got a newspaper, he rolled it up tight, as tight as you can, and hold in the middle, you know, right in the middle, and you can hit a guy in the heart and the stomach, and you can knock him out and we'll kill him. You understand what I mean? Uh, it's, but you have to roll the paper tight now, and it's like a knife. It won't go through you, but I mean, say, you'll kill him by taking a, knocking the wind out of you, and it could actually kill you, he said. So you've had a, uh, a, a great life, a great family, I uh, started from a great family of fishermen, and you, I know you have your children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, you, you went to war, and um, you were a secret agent, you know, uh, my uncle the secret agent. So uh, from, from all your experience, what kind of advice would you want to give uh, your grandchildren and people out there today? Because you have uh, 90 years, 90 years young. Uh, is there some words of wisdom, that a cardinality words of wisdom that you'd like to leave us with? Well, I'll tell you. If the chance to, to get into a, a secret service and tell them, go after it. Go after it. Nothing else. That's, 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 that's dangerous, but it's, it was a good job. We had first class everything. You were 22 years old. Uh, you didn't fear anything when you were 22. Not like today. I'm 90 years old. If I hear a pin drop, I jump like a rabbit. <laughs> But those days, 22 years old, uh, you can face anything, anything and anybody. 